you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining us here in the uh, Darling International Convention Centre for our second issue briefing of annual meeting of the new champions 2015. Welcome also to our online audience watching live at weforum.org. My pleasure to be joined by a, a, a panel which is certainly different from our, our last one. We were talking about artificial intelligence and robotics, very much a, a future-looking um, glimpse uh, into innovation. Now we're talking very much about the, the here and now, about the digital transformation that is affecting every industry on the planet and uh, you know, by its nature, it's affecting society as well. So we're going to be, um, first of all, talk to my colleague Bruce Vinelt. Uh, he's been conducting a study at the forum into how industries are being affected. Bruce, perhaps you could uh, you know, start off by talking about some of your key findings over the industries you've studied. So we um, started a project this year called Digital Transformation of Industries in which we're analyzing the impact of digitization in various sectors. And we're doing this across nine sectors this year and we're doing it across another nine ones next year. Um, the sectors we're dealing with this year range quite broadly along the digitization curve, along the maturity curve of digitization from electricity through to media, through to healthcare. Um, we're talking to our colleagues in automotive, supply chain, logistics. And the findings are actually very, very interesting. Digitization clearly impacts every single industry, but in different ways. Um, just to maybe talk about two industries, one, of the, one is the healthcare industry, which is really, as an industry, is going to be probably most impacted of all of these through digitization. Um, historically, it hasn't really been a particularly consumer-centric industry. If you think about you as a consumer or a patient, um, you make a phone call to a doctor, you get an appointment which is not necessarily imminent, even though you'd like help immediately. Um, it's at a time that is rather inconvenient to you. You have to wait in a doctor's office and you're sitting there with people who are sporting other infectious illnesses. So it's not really, not really customer-centric or it hasn't been. However, um, the introduction of digital healthcare services is really, really going to change that quite significantly because that puts people at the heart of the services um, that are out there. Um, Global spend is actually 7.5 trillion US dollars in the healthcare industry. So for the people who actually win this race, both incumbents or, or new startups, the, 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 um, the benefit is potentially very huge, but there's also a lot of regulation to be taken into account. There's a lot of inhibitors, basically, in the healthcare industry. Um, just one more example, maybe, is the automotive industry. Um, the automotive industry, I mean, in a session this morning, we talked about it as a guerrilla industry. There's really the big manufacturers who are there. Um, however, digitization is really going to bring more disruption or more transformation in the next 20 years than it has seen over the last 100 years. Um, two of the trends are really very much the connected traveler. So when people step into a car now, they don't only expect to drive the car, but they expect to hear their music, they expect to be able to go online, they expect a completely different host of services from what they used to, um, which is also the reason why we see a lot of non-traditional entrants into the industry, such as Google, such as um, Alibaba, um, I think two days ago, Sony announced that they are thinking of entering the automotive industry. And the second trend that we see there very much is the autonomous vehicles. So actually, cars will start driving themselves. We already have assisted driving, but this will be taken to the next level where cars are self-driving. Um, and that's going to have quite an impact on a multiple of other industries. So a lot of really interesting findings, um, a fantastic topic. So. The digital transformation starts here. Justin, you're the Chief Executive Officer of Accent, uh, one of our forum technology pioneers. How do you sum up business response and readiness to today's digital transformation? You work across a range of industries, of course. Yeah, I think that, you know, it's a complex question because I think you have to break uh, readiness and response into two sectors. One is kind of internal readiness and response. How are people adapting to the changes in, the, in kind of digital technology, but then also kind of the competitive landscape? So um, I think that if you look at uh, businesses that are founded today or created today, um, they're starting in a cloud world. Uh, we typically see um, people architecting their IT infrastructures in a very different manner, um, where we actually see more challenges adapting to uh, changes in the digital landscape are in existing organizations. Uh, how do they adapt to the digitization of data? So if you take healthcare as an example, which you mentioned, in healthcare, as you see electronic documents and electronic medical records becoming more mainstream methodology uh, of storing confidential patient information, um, how are organizations adapting to that from a security perspective? Um, uh, how are people adapting to kind of the global workforce? There's 
more of this sense of employees having the ability to work from home, uh, the boundaries and walls of a business extending beyond physical walls, um, but rather to kind of digital walls, uh, people having organizations where there's a large percentage of the workforce that works from home and it's distributed. Uh, with that brings a whole new set of complex challenges from a digital perspective, but also freedom to access talent from anywhere in the world. Uh, so I think you know, if you look at the broad landscape, uh, there are those businesses that are being formed today in a digital world that are adapting quickly, um, those that have huge legacy architectures and infrastructures and legacy employee structures that, of course, have challenges. But most businesses that we talk to and interact with, I think, are um, very focused on that as a key part of their sustaining as an organization going forward. Um, but it's going to be kind of a 10, 20 year cycle to see people catch up to what's going on in digital information. But then there's the old external force, which I think is something that is very critical because what you've seen in the past five years really is organizations that historically would have been believed to be untouchable uh, from a disruption perspective, a digital disruption perspective, being disrupted. So of course things like um, hotels, right? How do you disrupt a hotel digitally? Well, five years ago, no one would have thought that was possible. How could you disrupt a hotel digitally? Maybe from an infrastructure perspective, a bookings perspective, but not from the actual core of what the business is. And then of course you have companies like Airbnb, which have fundamentally disrupted something that has physical walls. Um, transportation industry, how would you disrupt from a digital perspective taxis? Well, again, prior to five years ago, people would have attacked that and looked at that from the perspective of how do you make routing more efficient or GPS more efficient, uh, charging more efficient, even hailing an existing taxi infrastructure more efficient. And now you have the whole concept of a taxi or, or transportation architecture disrupted. Um, and I think that's going to happen across every major industry. So one of the big topics in Silicon Valley is, is there any industry at all that's safe from digital disruption? And people are rapidly concluding that although we don't have clear visibility into how some of the most antiquated um, and historical legacy architectures of industry are going to be disrupted, that anything is disruptable. Great question. I was going to actually follow up with, 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 with that. Are any, any industries uh, at all disrupt, disruption-proof? Uh, Peter, you work across a range of industries. Uh, just to introduce you, you're the global MD uh, for strategy and sustainability at Accenture. Which industries are the winners and which are the losers in, in your experience? And where is, where is disruption being adapted to best? And, and, uh, and, and where are we seeing you know, huge seismic shifts in the, landscape, in the competitive landscape? Well, I'll start by saying I love the quote, any industry is disruptable. I think we would, we would probably, broadly speaking, agree with that. The question is the, the pace and the scale of change in different industries. And, and clearly, I think at the moment, to answer your question, Oliver, we're seeing a wide spectrum of industry adoption and industry disruption. I think, um, so let me take a step back and then, and then answer it in more depth. I think the first thing to say is that uh, we believe and we see this day to day with our clients that digital disruption is real, it's here, and it's actually happening at a greater scale and faster pace than anyone anticipated. And we're seeing that day to day across a number of different industries using different technologies, the industrial internet of things, cloud computing, data analytics, uh, the next wave of social media. But that's not the real story. The real story for me is exactly as Justin was saying, the real story is the innovative new business models that those technologies and the combinations of those technologies are bringing to bear. And I think that the World Economic Forum's project now, um, you know, we're very pleased to be partnering with the, the WEF on this, uh, its attempt to map out now and on the road to Davos and beyond um, these industry roadmaps and to, for the first time, I think, globally, to give us a, a real picture of what's happening, both within industries and across industries, is really useful and, and I think a unique contribution to understanding this era of digital disruption. To then go to your specific point, I mean, industries, in my view, that are being most disrupted are those that what we're seeing I guess is the sort of second wave of digitalization where we're seeing players entering um, traditional verticals, traditional value chains like energy for example, like automotive and 
providing far better customer propositions and disintermediating the existing players. Right? So examples of that, you've used Airbnb, that's a great example. Um, but it doesn't necessarily always have to be small, innovative businesses emerging, disrupting. It's just that in many cases, incumbents in those industries have not responded quickly enough. And that's a story that we see universally across industries. Some examples of where some bigger companies have responded well, for example, Michelin in the automotive sector, shifting its business model away from selling tires to selling the number of kilometers traveled by that tire using digital technologies, using sensors, using devices, providing tires as a service rather than tires as a product, and having an internal innovation engine that allows you to disrupt yourself. So I think my quote would be that, that actually it's different across different industries, but either you disrupt yourself or you will be disrupted. And that is going to happen, as Justin mentioned, right across sectors. That's it. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really interesting point. Of course, we look into the sharing economy and the circular economy here a, a lot at the forum and how, to, yeah, how, to, how new business models can extract more value and, uh, through greater services. Well, very, very quickly, the, the Michelin example is a great example of where the circular economy actually plays out as another element of that. What happens with digitization, for example, of their services, that by embedding sensors in the tyre technologies, they design things differently because they know they're going to get them back at the end of life cycle. So they design them for remanufacturing, they design them for recycling renewable materials. So they actually close their own loop. So as well as the business benefit and the customer benefit, you also end up with a broader societal and environmental benefit. It all goes back to the asset optimization. Exactly. It's asset optimization that is enabled by digitization. Exactly that. And, and, and essentially what, what's really happening, the real disruption is um, providing better customer solutions, citizen solutions, um, using these blends of technologies. And in some cases, you know, what that technology allows you to do is to dematerialize that. So in actual fact, you see that shift from products to service in tires, you actually don't need to throw the tire away or turn it into you know, uh, incinerated energy at the end. You can actually reuse it, repurpose it, remanufacture it, and, and use it again. Yep. It's generally at this stage where I invite the floor to ask any questions. I've had a few over social media um, in, the, in, the, yeah, um, in the coming, in the preceding couple of hours. So I'm happy to continue, but do we have any questions here? Okay, all right, let's move straight on to our, one of our questions that came in over the, uh, over the internet this morning. Um, disruption, of course, a big question here, obviously, is always jobs. Are you bullish or bearish about the digital transformation? And um, perhaps, Peter, we'll start with you this time. This is a great question. Um, uh, this is a real debate going on amongst economists at the moment. You know, so there's a real debate going on globally amongst around the theme of labour productivity and technology and what it means in terms of disruption. Um, you know, I think the, the the real answer is that um, as we've seen in various different phases of the Industrial Revolution, you can sort of decide whether you believe the German model that we're in 4.0 or we're in 3.0 or but, but let's say we're you know, moving through probably the fourth wave of the Industrial Revolution in terms of the combination of digital technologies. You know, what we've seen in all the other phases is that there is real disruption, and it does, in a Schumpeterian sense, it does create disruption in a positive way. You lose some industries, you gain other industries, and, and actually what you find is that, uh, that you need to repurpose people, but there is a lot of turmoil in that. So I would say that I'm bullish about the ability for digital to free up resources to provide better customer citizen outcomes, um, but I'm realistic that that will require the transformation of a lot of different workforces. And I guess the, the final point I would make there, and this is I think very important for this project, and it is a key part of this project, looking at the societal implications of the digital transformation of industries, um, you know, as part of the story and, and broad, broadly WEF's future of industry of, of the internet um, projects. I think, you know, you only have to look back to the Industrial Revolution in the UK. There's a term called Luddite, um, which was you know, back in the, the 19th century. Um, you know, Luddites resisted the, the first wave of the Industrial Revolution. They were smashed machines all over the UK because they thought it meant the end of jobs for weavers and spinners. So that has always been the case. What does it mean for us? What does it mean for WEF? Well, it means that this is a unique public-private platform where we need to discuss how to take the majority of stakeholders on the journey through dis you know, digital disruption because people don't like change. And so we have to make sure that the case is made and that the journey is managed. 
Justin, you're a, you're, you're a fast-growing technology pioneer. You've probably displaced jobs with your uh, disruptive business model. I'm sure you've created some as well. What's your views on this one? You know, again, it's, it's a complex question. So I think it's a matter of what time horizon you look at it. I think there's no question that you're going to see, um, as you rightfully said, a lot of jobs disrupted. Uh, the reality is that um, you're going to have technology replace what normally took a uh, human being from either a label, labor perspective or an analysis perspective. I think that one of the things that's most interesting to me is a lot of the discussion in the early days about how technology would impact the labor force was that it would impact the lower end of the labor force. So that, you know, improvements in manufacturing and automation and robotics would replace human labor. But the reality is, I think, if you look at where the most disruption is probably going to be, it's actually going to be in that mildly to actually well-skilled labor um, probably disrupt the middle class the most because what you're going to see with machine intelligence, artificial intelligence, analytics improvements is a lot of the analysis jobs will probably be disrupted by technology. I think, though, the time horizon to look at it is very important because um, if you look at disruptions historically, one of the differences today is the fact that if you look at the Renaissance or the agricultural revolution or industrial revolution, these took period over longer periods of time. The digital disruption today is happening at accelerating rates so fast that people can't predict what jobs are going to be disrupted, what industries are going to be disrupted, because it takes a matter of single-digit years for entire disruptions to occur. Um, that's going to be a challenge. The, on the other hand, though, I think it's a generational challenge in that what will happen is as jobs are replaced by technology, new job opportunities will be created. And education really becomes the solve for that, which is if you have education, improvements in education to focus on creating workers for the digital era, there will be no shortage of jobs, in my opinion, for digitally skilled workforce. So yes, there will be disruption. Um, it's unpredictable where that disruption will take place. It'll happen, I think, more in the middle class than people realize, middle class worker. I think then when you look at it from a time horizon perspective, it will happen faster in some ways than people predict. But then if you look at it from a long-term perspective, as long as we enter that with eyes wide open, say, okay, that means we need to have shifts in, tech, in education to improve skilled workers, to improve technology and digitally oriented workers, those jobs will be recreated down the line. Point just in, in the context of the conversation we had earlier about robotics and artificial intelligence, and the, and the point there was made that robots actually could play a, a, a very um, valuable role in the Chinese manufacturing sector, for example, by, by, by replacing jobs that cannot be filled um, because the, the, the supply chain keeps the manufacturing in China, but there is not enough labor for, you know, for the roles available. So it's interesting to see the middle class is taking, taking the hit and possibly you know, something which we may not all think about. Um, Bruce, you've been looking at six industries over the past few months. Any, any thoughts about um, you know, the job challenge for those industries that you've been studying? Um, yeah, that's actually come up in the conversation quite a few times. But just to add what, um, what was said previously, um, there's also the approach, we just had a fantastic session this morning, a private session. This came up very much around the education system and, and jobs and upskilling and reskilling. And um, what you mentioned earlier on, Justin, is also that technology can actually help in that. We had an example today where we talked about virtual reality glasses actually helping the low-skilled laborer understand the next, the highest skilled job and helping him or her in executing that job. So it's not only that technology either replaces, destroys, with a glass half empty or creates new jobs. It's actually technology is an enabler to create these new positions. It's an enabler to cross and upskill individuals into positions that without technology they would never be able to actually take on. Um, so I think there's, it's, there's a risk obviously, there's a threat, there's an opportunity, but technology, uh, technology sits across all of these things in the spectrum. It really is the fundamental driver in this change in more than just one single sense. Come back to this, uh, but I want to go off piece a little bit first because we've got Justin here, he's just recently made a, a technology pioneer. And the question that came in this morning, which I thought was a very good one, is that when it comes to succeeding in technology, is it more important to be using breakthrough technology or, as some people have suggested, to package and simplify existing technology? We see, and again, it, it goes to the pace of innovation. We're, you know, businesses often can't keep up with the pace of innovation. It just takes a bit of time as a lag before somebody actually realizes what can be done and how it can, how it can be leveraged and packaged and made easy and, 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 and valuable to a consumer or an end user. What's your, what's your view there? This is a conversation we actually have internally on a regular basis and that I have with our engineering team and that is a, a broad topic of discussion in Silicon Valley, which is ultimately, uh, and I think it was Peter that said this earlier, it's about what you deliver to the customer. 
I mean, really, technology is an enabler. Technology is what enables you to improve customer experience, to improve education, to improve the product that the customer purchases. So innovation for the sake of innovation um, is not actually innovation. It's how is the customer impacted? And when you look at it through that lens, the answer to that question becomes rather easy, which is what is the, the simplest path to delivering a better product, a better service, a better customer experience? Um, what is the best path to reducing costs, to making a product or a service more affordable? It's a combination of both is the reality. The smartest companies figure out where the greatest need for disruption in existing technology is. Where is the gap? Where is there an IP gap? Where does something need to be created, uh, created developed to solve the problem in a different way? And then leverage existing technologies and repackage existing technologies around that. So I think the key is to identify where's the gap, where's the challenge that no one has an answer to, make that the core of your IP. Everything else that you don't need to build, that isn't a core part of the IP, that isn't a core part of the disruption, repackage, simplify, and use existing technologies. And it's that balancing act, I think, that the best companies are finding. It's truly a balancing act. Those that have a not invented here mentality are suffering, including startups that believe that they have to be completely innovative from ground up and replatform everything. Um, they're going to be disrupted by those that more intelligently find the balancing act and leverage existing p repackaged technologies, but then figure out their clear points of intellectual property. It's a frighteningly complex situation, as we, as we all know. So I'm going to um, challenge you all to give me one or two priorities that business and maybe even government should be looking at. If they, if they, if they had to choose one or two areas of priority action when it comes to future-proofing or even reinforcing their success in the digital transformation? What should they focus on most? And Peter, let's start with you again. Uh, okay, so you, gave, you gave, asked for two uh, sort of stakeholder constituencies, I guess. So the, the one for, I think, for business, let me tackle multinationals and the, the larger companies, and, and I maybe can leave the others to, to tackle some of the more smaller innovators. I, I think um, in the work that we did previously uh, with WEF uh, that we launched in Davos, the Industrial Internet of Things, one of the things that came back very, very clearly with, from that was that there is a real awareness amongst business that uh, disruption is real and it's coming in their industry. I forget the exact statistic, but I think it was more than 70% of respondents to the survey we put together uh, said that they thought it was real and it was coming in the next few years, but only 7% of them had investment plans on digital. And so I think the, the real... Uh, that's a fair point. I, I, I would say yes. I mean, you'd have to be in an industry that I haven't worked in to, worth, to believe that that's not going to happen to you in the next five years. So yes. So two frightening numbers is part of that. Um, but I think the, the, the really they need to start to think very carefully about the disruption. I think often the response of multinationals to the digital transformation challenge and disruption is to think about digitizing their existing businesses, not rethinking their business model. So for example, it's about how do I use less screens in a customer service call center rather than uh, how do I completely eliminate my customer service unit. For example, when was the last time anyone called Google? Right? When did you call Google up and, and complain about a product and get on the phone and ask them whether or not they could help fix something? So it's about really fundamentally rethinking the business model and the way you interact with customers. For governments, I mean, uh, you know, we think that to 2030, just one area of digital transformation, um, the, the industrial internet of things, will represent a $14 trillion global economic opportunity. Here in China, somewhere between 500 billion and 1.8 trillion, and that's the key. The policy measures that you take now um, will dictate whether or not it's the 500 billion or the 1.8 trillion. So there's a lot of value at stake. I would say that probably the most important uh, thing at this stage is twofold. One is to um, really put in place the customer-friendly, customer-secure, customer-trustworthy um, platforms that you have industry standards, that you have uh, the right um, level of confidence uh, in industries and solutions, and government has a key role to play with that in terms of putting in place the policy, putting in place the architecture that allows industries to compete on a level platform, on a level playing field, and on a common ground, and have citizen and consumer trust. The second thing I would say is that we need to find ways and means to create technical standards, um, because that's really going to be one of the things 
things that allows us to create uh, more and more opportunities, more and more uh, opportunities for entrepreneurs and large businesses. We need systems in different technologies and digital to be able to interoperate, uh, to be able to talk to each other, and that's going to be key. And again, governments and industries have a key role in setting those standards. So those are the two th uh, things, I think, on the government side. Yeah, I, th I think Peter makes a, a very good point, which is um, the reality is if you look kind of, I think, t prior to five, ten years ago, um, from an investment perspective, and both internally at large companies or from a venture capital private equity perspective, what people looked for in terms of good investment opportunities was how do I disrupt a legacy architecture? Um, but it was usually in some sort of um, you know, small improvement, incremental improvement manner. So how do I make it a little better? How do I make it a little more efficient? How do I make it more cost effective? And the reality is the discussions now in, in organizations that are large and innovative, as well as in venture capital and private equity, is people are most attracted to how do I create an entirely new industry around this? How do I solve it in a completely different way that totally obsoletes and disrupts how it was being done before? And when you look at the Ubers and Airbnbs and the, yeah, all these in the world, that's actually what they, they're doing. They're not taking existing um, um, kind of revenue streams and disrupting them in an incremental manner. It's kind of an entire paradigm shift and a new industry created. Um, when, when you think about kind of top priorities, um, you know, just to point out two, one is really around that, that innovation priority, which is how do you create a innovation team internally in an organization to constantly be challenging yourself from an innovation disruption perspective. Because the reality is, to your point on should we be concerned about 70%, yes, every single company should be concerned about disruption, 100%. Startups, growth companies, existing uh, enterprise organizations all are under a constant threat of disruption, and disruption is happening at an absolutely incredible pace, uh, an pace that's unprecedented. So everyone has to be looking at disruption, and if you don't disrupt yourself, you will be disrupted by somebody else. So how do you create an organization of innovation? How do you create a disruption team internally? Then looking uh, from a more classical sense at, at kind of the digital um, priorities, especially at, at large organizations and governments, it's all around security, information protection, um, threat detection, um, understanding the risks of cyber intrusion, cyber attacks, uh, the futures of, of kind of warfare, both in terms of geopolitical and in terms of um, more kind of business war, is, is going to be cyber warfare, for sure. And so how are you preparing for that? How are you creating architectures and systems internally to assume that you will be intruded or hacked um, by either a competitor or by another government? Bruce. Um, I, complete, I completely agree with everything you've said. We've mentioned things like trust, standards, innovation, preparedness, um, which really ticks all the boxes of what I really wanted to say. Um, the one thing that I would probably add on top of that is uh, we talk constantly in digitization, we talk about blurring industry lines, we talk about partnerships rather than competition, even though competition is part of it. And I think if you actually elevate that to a level, um, what we do at the forum is this cross-industry discussion. And I think that's one of the things that is absolutely key here. It is disruption that is cross-industry, if you even know what, how to define an industry. So it's a cross-industry discussion both at the business level but also the government level, which are the two audiences that you talked about earlier on. So have a very honest and open discussion how you're being disrupted, how, what technology transformation, digitization is doing to you with your peers and in other industries to learn more. And at the same time, I think also governments need to look at um, standardization at policy cross industry. Just as one example, for instance, the topic of cross border data flow. Um, in the telecoms world, people will say, Yep, I know this, this is quite simple, it's contested, but it's simple, it's called roaming. Um, if you talk about healthcare, um, it, it, people would love to have cross border data flow, but regulation goes against it. If you talk in the automotive industry, um, people are scratching their heads because for the first time we've got connected vehicles. Cars have always driven across borders, but it was never a regulatory issue, or at least not from a digital perspective. So it really is, um, to recap what I was saying, cross-industry discussion within the industries themselves and all key stakeholders, which is civil society, but also have this thought process of cross-industry best practice policies and regulation to put this digitization, uh, this, this transformation really in place and help to reach the numbers that you, Peter, talked about earlier on at the higher level rather than the lower level. Look at some of the most disruptive 
enterprise organizations, large scale, multinational, kind of global 1,000 organizations, there are quite a few that have actually been very intelligent about bringing young, disruptive people from completely out of industry onto either their leadership teams or even at a board or advisory level to help them kind of cross-pollinate well, what are you doing in this industry, different industry, different digital age, people brought up in kind of a different world to spark that innovation from a leadership level. And that's actually not enabled those organizations, Starbucks is an example, um, and Intuit's another one, um, to really change how they look at the world and prepare themselves for disruption internally. So I think that's critical. Different industry and kind of different perspective. Yep. Yep. Fascinating conversation, gentlemen. I'd like to thank you all very much. I'd like to also thank uh, our audience uh, here in the room and also watching us live online at weforum.org. This session is now closed. Thank, thank you very, very much. much.